Hey everyone, in this video I want to talk about the new cold storage tier that has just been introduced. And I wanted to really talk about, well, why do we have this? We have existing storage tiers with hot and cool and archive. So what gap does this new cold tier actually fix? So let's take a step back. So if we think about, we have the idea of, well, we have a storage account. So a storage account offers us many different types of service we can consume. And what I'm gonna focus on right now is those block blobs. So we have the idea of our block blobs, which are very versatile, and that we can really store anything we want in those. We can have big amounts of unstructured data, like a media file, I can have semi-structured data like a JSON file, CSV. I can even have fairly structured data. If I had a parquet file, for example, I can store structured data. But it's a big flat structure. Um, we might get the idea that there's a virtual directory structure there by making a directory part of the name, but it's not. It's just this big flat structure. And then if we wanted to, on the storage account, optionally, we can enable a hierarchical namespace and this we commonly refer to as the Azure Data Lake Storage Gen 2. And that then becomes a true file system. We actually have this true file system where I can store content and real directories. And the big deal here is because it's a true directory structure, I can actually do real renames. I can do real moves. And then that's just a very singular fast atomic operation. It's not a copy and delete, which is what we have to do with a blob if we rename it or try and move it. We get POSIX style ACLs, we get other types of API. But for both of these, there's many different ways we want to interact with the data. There's different sizes of data, and then there's different frequencies of how we interact, and then how much of the data we actually interact with. I can think about for some of the data, there is this constant access. And I'm also accessing lots of the data within each of the files. I might have rare access. So it's infrequent. Hey, periodically, I may want to go and get to some bit of data. And then I have other scenarios where I just want to store it. I may have no intention of ever interacting with that data. I just have to keep it. Maybe it's some regulatory period of time I have to keep it for. I just need it there. Maybe banking seven years is a very popular number in seven years. And again, we really have to think about for these files, I might have this really big file, but I only interact with a tiny amount of the data in that file. And that's another important thing to think about when I start to think about, well, how can I optimize the storage of that data? Because, hey, I've got this storage account. It's storing in the cloud. So what's special about the cloud? Well, remember, in the cloud, what do we pay for? Well, we pay for what we use. So if I think of storage, what are some of the dimensions of that? Obviously, there's the capacity. The amount of size on disk I'm actually using. So I'm paying for that Gibby bytes uh, on average per month. Then I'm actually performing also operations. It could be a read operation, it could be a write operation, it could be iterative. For example, on a, a data lake with real directories, it could be a call to say, we'll go through every file and subfolder within this directory. If it's just regular blob, hey, list all the blobs in this container. So it's iterative type operations. Well, I pay for those. There may also be the idea, well, there's a certain amount of data transferred. For example, if I'm doing a read, then there's data retrieved from it. So maybe I'm also paying for the gigabytes of data retrieved. And then there are also some additional ones. So this depends on what features I turn on. But I may see things like, well, I want to use SFTP. I want to use blob indexing. I want to use the change feed. I might want to use encryption scope. So there's just other things that I may pay for as part of that service. 
And remember, even within a single application, I'm gonna have these variances in how I access and need to utilize the data. Okay, so I pay for the data I consume and I pay for the operations and I have this mixture. Well, how do I optimize what I pay for then? And that's the whole point of why we have these idea of storage tiers. Now, this is really focused around these general purpose V2, these blob storage accounts. We shouldn't really use blob storage accounts anymore unless we're doing premium. And premium is its own thing. Premium is a type of storage account. I pick the performance tier when I create it. Today, it doesn't really have tierings, it's just premium. If I have a general purpose V2 or blob, I get these tiers available to me for how I pay for different dimensions of that data. So if I think about those dimensions for a second, what did we have? Well, remember we had the capacity, we had the operations, we had the data retrieval, and then also there may be I have to keep it for a certain amount of time. So let's have the idea that there's a minimum um, time. I'm gonna say this is in days. So there are these different considerations I have to give. So what the, I guess, the original, the traditional tier is, is hot. So we have our hot tier. And if I, I guess we'll draw the sun, it's very hot. And so we, we pay for different aspects. Now with hot, I pay the most for the capacity. So I pay money for the amount of data that I'm actually storing. I, I pay the most other than premium, I pay the most for that storage. But for the operations, I pay the least. I don't have to pay as much. And I don't even pay for that Gibby bytes of data retrieved, so it doesn't apply. And there is no minimum time. I could write something and delete it near straight away if I wanted to. Now, I notice I'm paying a lot for the capacity here. So this is a really good fit if it's data I'm constantly interacting with, but maybe more importantly, I'm interacting with a large portion of the data. And what I mean by that, imagine this was a 100 megabyte file, and yes, I'm constantly interacting with it, but I'm only interacting with a couple of K each time. So it's a tiny portion of the overall file. That may not be the right option then, because yes, I'm constantly interacting with this huge file, but I'm only actually talking to a tiny, tiny part of it. But if I was interacting with lots of the file, well then it's worth storing that lots of file in this nice hot tier because I paid lot less for the operations. And we can see this, if we jump over for a second, let's go and look. This is the pricing page. And what we can see is I'm using, in my example here, just flat. I am not using the hierarchical namespace. I'm just doing LRS, which means it's just three copies in the same data center, same cluster in East US and ignore premium, again, that's its own thing. But if I think about the amount I'm paying, we'll look at hot. Hot is actually the most expensive out of all of these ones I can see, basically two cents. And then there's the other ones that get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, okay? But if we actually then go and look at the operations I perform, if we look at that same selection, Hot is the cheapest. I pay the least for all of the interactions for those write and read operations. And I don't ever pay for the data writes for any of them, but for hot, I don't pay for data retrieval either. So yes, I'm paying more for the actual capacity 
but then I pay the least for the operations against it. And again, premium, its own thing, its own selection when I create the storage account, but that I pay even more for the capacity and sometimes I don't pay for any of those interactions with it. So we have hot. We also then, as you saw on that board, we have the idea of call. So if we think about call, I don't want color to use for call, we'll use, uh, we use that for call. So we have the idea of call. So if I'm call, I don't know how to draw the idea of call. Uh, maybe it's someone wearing a, a baseball cap and they're wearing a cool pair of shades maybe, and they're just very happy. So we've called, we saw, well, I pay less for the capacity. I pay less money for the capacity, but now I pay more for the operations, and now I do pay for the data retrieval. So I do pay some money for the data retrieval, and I have to keep it there for a minimum of 30 days. So if I was to delete it before 30 days, let's say I deleted it after 20 days, it would still charge me for 10 days more of storage in that tier because at that minimum amount of time, I have to keep it there. And so you can see what's happening here. There's gonna be a balance. There's always a balance when I think of these between the storage, the capacity, and then the interactions, the operations, the data retrieval. It's always this balancing act that I need to look at and say, okay, well, how much do I need to store? And what is the nature of that storage? What proportion of that data am I interacting with and how often? And that's gonna help me drive, well, what tier should I use for all of these? That's, that's gonna guide all of our thinking. So everything we're doing is all about, well, what choices do I actually have? And then we have this idea of archive. Okay, so then down here we have archive. And for archive, we'll just draw a box, I guess. A very poor box. We're just storing stuff, or it could be a toaster, whatever that is. Now for archive, we pay the least. We pay a tiny, tiny amount of money but the key point here is this data is not available in real time. It's offline. I have to rehydrate it back up into a higher tier to actually be able to get to the content. The metadata I can still get to, but if I want to actually read the content, I can't. I have to do an operation to bring it out of archive and put it into one of those higher up tiers. And that operation, I'm just gonna draw a bag, a pretty big bag. Cost me a lot of money. And it cost me a lot of time. It, I think it's something that can be up to 15 hours to bring that out. Or you can do an accelerated, if it's less than a certain amount, that might take one hour. And I pay more money for that again. And it has to stay here for 180 days. I have to keep that now for archive, that's probably not a problem. I'm putting it there because I want to keep it for a long time. But realize, hey, it's gonna cost me quite a lot of money and there's gonna be a delay. So this is great for data that I just have to keep because of some regulatory requirement. And if I do have to access it, I can have a lag in that time. So this is where we are. This is what we have today. But there's a pretty huge gap in the price between call and archive. And I may have other data that, hey, I just need to keep. I don't intend to have to interact with it, but if I do have to interact with it, I can't wait maybe 15 hours or even one hour. Think of medical records. I think it could be some um, disaster recovery scenario. It could be compliance, media, medical, that I need in basically near real time. I might want it indexed and tagged. There's features I need, and this just doesn't meet my requirements. Yes, it's really nice and cheap, but I can't afford that delay. I'm limited on some of the features I can have. So, given the name of this talk, our solution is this new cold tier. And I have no idea how to draw cold, so I'm just gonna draw the idea of kind of a, an icicle. That's the best you're gonna get out of me for trying to show 
cold. There you go, snowflake, cold. And exactly as you draw in this picture, what do you think it's gonna be? Well, I pay less than cool for the storage. I think it's 60% on average is cheaper than cool, but it's online, it's available immediately. I'm gonna pay a little bit more than cool for the right operations. So I'm paying a bit more money there. I think certain date retrieval is a tiny bit more expensive here, and it has to be kept for 90 days. So again, if I try to delete it out of cold before 90 days, let's say it's been in there 50 days, well, it would still charge me for an additional 40 days as well. So cold now fits nicely in this scenario where I do just need to keep this data. I don't intend to interact with it very often at all, but when I do need to interact with it, I need it in real time. I cannot wait an hour or 15 hours for it to be rehydrated through. And yet, again, it's pretty obvious to see what happens. It's always a trade-off. Hey, as I go up the tiers, well, as I go up the tiers, I pay more for the capacity side of it, but then, as I pay less for the capacity, well then I pay more for the operations. It's that balancing act. I pick, hey, I'll pay more for the capacity so I can pay less for the operations because I'm gonna interact a lot with most of the data I'm storing, or hey, I'm not interacting that often, and or I'm only interacting with a tiny portion of the size of the file, I'll go down a tier. So this is the idea between all of this is we have these choices and I can balance this. Now what's nice about this is this cold tier, like all of the others, is available for both that scenario where it's just blob and where it is the data lake. Now this is a completely boring demo, but I'll just show it really quickly. So if I was to jump over here, now at time of recording it is in preview, so it's only in certain regions. But here you can see this is just regular blob. And what do I have here? I've got four files in the same one. One in hot, one in cold, one in cool, and one in archive. And do remember, one of the nice things you can do today is you can upload directly into a tier. I can upload directly into archive if I wanted to. I can upload directly into cool. So I don't have to maybe upload it to hot, which is maybe is the default, and then I have to pay for those operations, then pay for other operations to move it. Don't do that. Just use the API, the commands to upload it directly into a specific tier. But here I can see all of them in the same one. You can easily just go from this and I can change the tier and I could move it into any tier I want. And just to really kind of prove the point, I've also got a data lake enabled. So with the data lake, the key point here is you have this hierarchical namespace, and I have exactly the same thing. Once again, I've got a file in each of the tiers. I don't have to do anything different. This is the key point. I don't have to change my behavior based on the tier. All of this should be transparent to you. All of this should just be, hey, I'm interacting with my blobs or my data lake in a certain way. I just happen to change certain data to different tiers to optimize my costs based on the patterns of interaction I have. Now, in an ideal world, I wanted to draw a nice line and say when you should use each. It does not work that way. Because again, this balance is so much about, well, it's not just how often I interact with it, it's what portion of the file I'm interacting with. Because again, if it was a 10 megabyte file and I'm interacting with all of that file very frequently, hot would be very obvious. But if I had the same 10 megabyte file and I was interacting with it frequently, but only a tiny, tiny fraction of the file, hot probably doesn't make as much sense. It would probably make sense, well, I'm spending too much money on the capacity, let's maybe spend less on the capacity and I'll pay a little bit more on the operations and I'll pay for the data retrieval because, hey, that balance between them starts to tilt more towards cool or cold. Um, again, archive is always gonna be a different consideration. 
in that, can I wait? Um, and am I fairly confident I'm gonna keep it in there for a certain period of time? So you do have to really balance up all those ideas of how often I'm interacting with, what portion of it am I interacting with, and am I okay with these minimum times, because obviously there's penalties for that. There are other optimizations you can do. If I have huge numbers of tiny files, consider packing them into one file. Because once again, then the operation is one operation to write it, one operation to read it, because maybe I've got 100 files packed into one file, as opposed to in 100 read operations or 100 write operations. And there's a lot of best practice around trying to really optimize what I'm doing that. So how can I pick uh, one of these? Hopefully you understand what cold is. It's just another tier, it's another set of options. And if we went and looked at the pricing again, just to kind of complete my picture there, it's pretty obvious. So if I focus on the hot, the cool, cold and archive, the price goes down and down and down as I go hot, cool, cold, archive. If I was to look at the operations, they go up from hot to cool to cold. If I look at, for example, um, read operations, you can see once again, the read operations get more and more expensive. And often also remember for archive, I get these huge bills to do the rehydration. But hey, yet the right operations go up in price from hot to cool to cold. The read operations go up from hot to cool to cold. The data retrieval fee starts at cool. I don't pay for it at hot at all, but it goes up from cool to cold. And you just get, there's maybe some other features available for different types of um, tier and if I've got the hierarchical namespace. But it's that whole idea of, hey, there's the balancer. So what other help can I get? Well, there's a nice spreadsheet um, so this is a workbook. Actually, I'll, I'll close this in the browser. We'll just open this in Excel. But if you're trying to find this, I've got the links in the description below. But this page is all about estimating cost of archive. But one of the things it has is if you search for workbook, it links to the workbook, which is what I'm showing here. Now, this page alone does a really nice job of walking through a lot of different scenarios and how I can use the tiering elements. But if I open up the spreadsheet for a second, now, I am not in any way attempting to go through the detail of this spreadsheet. At a super high level though, notice I basically have four columns here representing pricing for archive, pricing for cold, pricing for call, and pricing for hot. And I think this is populated right now with the pricing for East US. And what this would let me do is see, well, based on the parameters I enter in this spreadsheet, what would be the pricing? Ignore the fact that it says call in all three of these columns over here. I think they've just pasted it incorrectly. That should be um, uh, cold over here and hot in the far one on the other side, they just cut and pasted funny. But it helps you see what the pricing would actually cost me. So in this case, the scenario they're talking about is, hey, I've got this amount of data, a million files, the average size is 10 megabytes, and I'm only interacting, in this case, with 1% of the file. So a tiny portion of the file is being interacted with. So you can see the various costs on the different tiers. So, if, so archive is obviously the way cheapest one here because I'm accessing such a tiny amount of the data and hot is by far the most expensive because I pay a huge amount for the capacity and while I pay less for the operations, there's not actually that many operations happening on it. And then cool and cold. But if I was to change this to say, well, instead of interacting with 1%, let's interact with all of the file every single time. 
suddenly the pricing changes massively. Archive now becomes by far the most expensive. Cold then becomes the next expensive, then cool. And hot would actually, if we scroll all the way over, hot becomes now the cheapest. Because while the capacity costs stayed the same in all of them, well, that says data hydration again. It's because the wording was based around archive. This is just the operations cost. I pay for almost nothing. My operations are really, really cheap in this model. And so I pay almost nothing. It's really cheap to actually use this. So this is a really nice tool to get an idea of how would these costs vary. There's even a nice little picture at the bottom that gives you an idea of the, what it would cost you. Hey, look, if I'm interacting with a tiny amount of the data, then archive is, hey, way cheaper. And notice in all of these, like hot pretty much stays consistent. But then the others, depending on how much I'm accessing, it changes um, based on what portion of the file. And of course, the size of the files would impact this as well. If I started messing around with the size of the files, that would fairly significantly change this as well. But that's just a nice tool to help you, um, to give you something to think about. It's just, I'm only using it to try and illustrate how those interactions can shift, what tier would actually make the most sense for you. Now, like all of these tiers, yes, I can manually move things, and there's, there'll be times I'll need to based on how I interact, but don't forget about features such as, for example, lifecycle management. So in a very simplistic way, lifecycle management can be used to create rules. For example, I might say, hey, look, after 30 days. Now, these rules can be based on things like creation or access. Access is really useful here. So I might say, hey, if it's not been accessed for 30 days, let's move it from hot to cool. I might have another rule that says, well, if it's not then been accessed for another 30 days. Now, the way I say that is this rule will be configured for 60 days. Because when you move a file from between tiers, it doesn't update the metadata of the file for its last access date. So if I was saying, hey, move it from hot to cool after 30 days, if I then want to move it from cool to cold after another 30 days, the total time would be 60 days. So my rule would be 60, but I've already waited 30 up here. It doesn't change that access date. Hey, move it from cold to cool after 60. Well, it moved it from hot to cool after 30, and now it's 60 here. And then maybe I'd say, hey, move it from cold to archive after 150 days, because 150 minus 60 is 90. I need to minimum leave it in cold for 90 days. I'll get that early deletion fee. So then after 150 in total from its original access, none of these moves, remember, changes the metadata of the access time, uh, go and move it into archive. So that's one of the options I could use to automate that process. And I did create one of those. So if we jump over for a second, if I go back to my original account and we look at lifecycle management. Now again, this is a very simplistic view because it is not considering other factors like all well, the size of the data they made you interact with. But notice I'm using the modification. So from hot to cool, so tier it to cool after 30 days, tier it to cold after 60 days, because again, I would have moved it to cool after 30. This is now another 30 after that, 60 in total. And then I'm tiering it to archive after a total of 150 days, because 60 days already in cool, and then that's 90 days it would have been sitting in cold. So that's just an example where I could automatically move that data between them if I wanted to. Now again, you might tweak that, you have different requirements. Again, that move to archive is a significant one because of that idea that it's not available in real time. 
So maybe that, that, that would be too fast. Maybe I have to have real-time access to anything within the last two years. But now I could leave it in cold, which is again, significantly cheaper than even cool, and definitely more cheaper than hot. So it's just more flexibility. It gives me better options for keeping that real-time access and not having to pay the cost of call, which is our current best option for keeping real-time access to it. The latency today is not any different. Be it hot or cool or cold, the time it takes to do an operation doesn't change. The SLAs are slightly different. There is a different SLA between hot and then cool and cold. I think this gives Microsoft future options on maybe how it implements some of these services. Uh, other considerations, I mean, on the whole, you should not care what tier the data is in. Again, forget about archive because it's offline, you have to treat it a bit special. But I shouldn't have to change how I do my APIs, my interactions, everything backup and versioning and softly should just work exactly the same. It doesn't matter what tier my data is in. Now, at time of recording, yes, uh, it's in preview. And because it's in preview, just a few things to consider. Change feed is not compatible yet with cold tier. Point in time of store is not with cold tier. Object replication is not compatible with cold tier today. You can't set the default access tier to cold because it's in preview. I would fully expect very quickly, maybe not even, maybe not a GA, but shortly afterwards, it will reach feature parity with hot and cool. They'll, they'll have the same features. It's just that it's a new, so they're, they're working on things, they're bringing it in over time. But that's it. I mean, it's not actually a complicated thing to understand if I understand tiering already, and I've done videos on that in the past. It's just another nice little option for you. And I think it bridges a nice gap that's existed that, hey, I, I need immediate access for many types of data. And there was this huge gap in pricing between call and archive. So I think cold does a really nice job of filling that gap for us. So that was it. Um, I hope that was useful and uh, stay warm.